So first we're going to take a look at the hardware that goes into the computer system that holds our valuable information asset. We're going to look at the computer itself, the CPU and the components in the CPU, and then we're going to look at memory, the types of memory that we use, and then we're going to look at applications, processes, and threads. There are many layers to the computer system and the operating system and applications that sit on top of this, and then of course the users that actually perform the, the or require the information that is being stored and processed by the computer system. All these components must work together and again ensure that we maintain the security of these valuable information assets. The heart and soul of the computer system is the CPU itself. There are many types of CPUs or central processing units and the operating system and the CPU must be designed and integrated to work together. We'll look now at the different components inside the CPU. That includes registers, which are small sections of memory, very high speed memory, very close electrically and physically to the CPU itself. Then we'll look at the core of the CPU, that's the arithmetic logic unit. This guy does the vast majority of the work inside the CPU. And then we have the control unit. The control unit acts as a traffic cop and coordinates the motion or the movement of instructions and data into and out of the CPU while it's being processed. First we'll look at registers. Again, reg a register is a small uh, storage area. It is memory, very high speed memory. It's generally located physically on the substrate that is the CPU itself. It is immediately accessible to the CPU. So the CPU can read directly from it and can write directly to it. Next is the ALU or the arithmetic and logic unit. The ALU again performs most of the work inside the CPU. He's the guy that does all the math and all the logic functions inside the system itself. The control unit again acts as a traffic cop. It's the control unit's job to coordinate the instructions and the data that is going to flow into and then out of the CPU. If the control unit is doing his job well, everything moves very uh, smoothly and efficiently. This is a great diagram that shows how the control unit first aligns instructions and data into generally what's called cache memory first. We'll talk about cache memory in a few moments. Uh, another term for instruction, by the way, is a thread. This instruction that we see in the diagram is actually also referred to as a thread. It is the actual process or small component of a process that the CPU is going to be working on. So the control unit first takes instructions and data from the cache memory area, which again is another storage area we'll be referring to momentarily, and he then directs those two components, the instructions and the data, into the registers. By the way, another word for register is a buffer. A buffer is also the, a register. So the control unit aligns the instruction and the data into the register, waiting for the CPU to finish whatever work he's doing at the moment and become available. When the CPU does complete the processing that he's performing at, the, at that point in time, the control unit then instructs the instruction and the data from the registers to proceed into the processor for the actual processing work. There are two types of registers. We have general registers, which we just saw. The buffers that we saw in the preceding diagram, these would be considered general registers. But then we also have special registers that are used more for control. One of the components that is significant here is the program status word and the program status word we'll be discussing a little further in just a moment. The significant component about the PSW is that it holds the bit, the flag, that identifies whether the particular component of processing, the thread and data, is operating in what's called user mode or operating in what's called privileged mode. User mode is a lesser trusted mode of operation where we're actually performing work for a subject 
and privileged mode is where it is the kernel of the operating system. The most trusted component in, in the system is the kernel, and in privileged mode we have full run on the system. The kernel is allowed to access any resource or object in the system, whereas user mode is much more controlled, much more restricted. So again, this PSW holds the bit that identifies the level of security that the CPU is currently operating in. This diagram shows at the bottom the hardware, all the components that go together to build this thing called a computer. But the computer itself is incomplete. It's unusable unless we have an operating system that sits on top of it. That's the section in the middle starting with the hardware abstraction layer and, and proceeding upward through the executive services. These are the components of the operating system. Now the section in the blue at the top of this diagram, these are the user's applications. These are the processes and uh, programs that the user desires to run that actually performs the productive work that the user is trying to accomplish. Next we're going to talk about applications, processes, and threads. A user double clicks on an icon. It is linked to some executable, some .exe file that has been compiled. That executable can launch one or many, many processes. Each of those processes can launch one or many, many threads. In a window or a 32-bit application, this is the way it works. One executable can launch multiple processes. Each process can launch multiple threads. The thread, of course, again, is the small instruction that the CPU can directly act upon. The process consumes resources uh, which are allocated to the process by the CPU itself, through the security system itself. In this diagram, we see three processes. Each process has multiple threads. Again, thread being the instruction. So again, the thread is an in individual instruction and again it is a subset of a process. The thread again can be directly acted upon by the CPU. Here we see examples of the types of work that individual threads may be performing. Again, thread being a subset of a process, a process being a subset of an application. Processes are in one of three states at all points in time. It's either running, which means it is actually in the CPU and is being executed by the CPU at that point in time. Ready is when the process or the thread is actually waiting for its turn in the CPU because the CPU can only act on a single thread at any one point in time. At any one instant, a single core CPU can handle a single thread, period. Now the trick here is when the CPU can handle two or three billion instructions per second, it appears as though it's handling multiple processes and threads simultaneously. In all actuality, it does not. It only handles at any one instant a single thread. So we have running state where the thread is being processed by the CPU. We have the ready state where the thread is waiting for its turn in the CPU. And then finally we have the blocked state where the process is actually waiting for something else, user input or perhaps it needs data from a preceding process to complete before it can actually uh, have all the information required to move forward and be processed itself. So three states, running, ready, and blocked. Next, we're going to look at how all this works together, how we actually move through individual processes and threads, move them through the CPU. First, we're going to look at interrupts. An interrupt is a polling process that the CPU performs. Processes and even device drivers are assigned different interrupts and the CPU polls through these various interrupts to see if there's any work that that particular process or driver uh, requires the attention of the CPU for. So again, this is a polling process and they're called interrupts. There are maskable interrupts and non-maskable interrupts. If an interrupt is maskable, it means it can be disabled or turned off. 
So we might allocate more time slices to a particular device by masking its interrupt periodically, which means the CPU doesn't poll that device for several time slices. We might also do this for security purposes, to disable less secure processes from functioning while we're trying to complete a more secure process. Processes are maintained in what's called a process table. This is a table that the system maintains to keep track of the processes that are currently being managed by the operating system. Remember, truly, only one process can only have one thread being worked on at any point in time. So we have to manage, keep track of all the processes while they're waiting their turn in the CPU itself. When we accept a process from an application, the system allocates resources in that process. One of those resources lives in a piece of memory, and we call this memory location for the process a stack. A stack uh, provides that process the resources that it has requested. Resources are the amount of memory for instructions and data input, so that when the process finally gets its turn in the CPU, it has all these components together so the control unit can slip these details into the CPU and actually have the instruction be worked upon. Here is an example of an application. At the top we see the application has five components going into a stack. Let's imagine that components 3, 4, and 5 from the application are data bits. They are variables that are plugging into some algorithm. The algorithm being the instruction, a thread, and that would be input number 2. So the instruction is number 2. And then we have three variables or pieces of data that the instruction is actually going to perform work upon. The last piece of input, the uh, item number 1 coming from the application at the top, is a return pointer that says, when this particular instruction is completed, what do I do next? We see that the, the instruction and the data then flows into the CPU, uh, the purple box to the right called the procedure. That's the CPU actually performing the work. And then down below, after that work has been completed, the CPU informs the stack that this work is now accomplished. What do we do next? And you see the instruction go back to the return pointer, and the return pointer feeds back to the application and says, all right, this particular stack has accomplished its task. So again, the stack is a register or area of memory that is allocated to the process. And we keep a process table that maintains a list of all the stacks and what the work is that's being done on those. Again, when the process has completed its turn in the CPU, uh, the CPU sends, it, sends a, an instruction or a flag back to the stack that says, this work is done. Now the return pointer identifies where to move to next. As the process is actually being uh, fil filed into the CPU, uh, there is also something called the stack pointer that keeps track of the individual discrete data components that are moving into the buffer memory, the registers, that the CPU is then going to be working upon. Next we're going to look at buses. We typically have address buses and data buses. Think of these buses as a major highway, an expressway, that is used to commute instructions and data within the computer system itself. These are used for input and output and to identify areas of memory to either read from or write to. That would be an address bus. And then we have the data bus. Now that I'm latched into this one location in memory, let's flow the information from that memory location in RAM to the cache memory and or buffer memory so that the CPU can work upon it. Here we see an example of the system buses to the right. We have the address buses and the data buses. Again, the wider these are, the more information we can flow with each clock cycle. These uh, address buses and data buses, again, commute instructions to memory and then read data to and from memory so that the CPU can perform the work on that particular piece of information.
On the left, we see the processor with the control unit, the ALU and CPU. And then, of course, we see the, the clocking. The whole system runs on a clock. So there is a single clock pulse that all components in the system can see. And this way, they can remain synchronized with the other components. A 32-bit architecture versus a 64-bit architecture. In the last couple of years, the 64-bit architecture has grown. What are we talking about? We're talking about the width of the address buses and the data buses on the motherboards of the computer systems themselves. The more lanes we have for these data bits, the more information we can commute in a single clock cycle. So if I needed to commute the same amount of data on a 32-bit bus versus a 64-bit bus, I'll need to, it will take twice as many clock cycles to get that data clocked through because the 64-bit bus has 32 more data bits per clock cycle. Here we see that all components, again, are controlled slash managed by the central processing unit. And again, they are all synchronized with that clock signal that we saw earlier. And again, the clock signal that we're talking about is generally the 2.4 gigahertz, the 3.6 gigahertz CPU clock that we see referred to when we go to purchase that computer system. Some definitions we need to get a handle on. Multiprocessing. Multiprocessing implies multiple CPUs in a single computer. So this would be a motherboard that has sockets for four CPUs. Remember, a single core CPU can only handle a single thread at any one instant. So if I needed to improve the processing capability of a computer system, one thing I can do is add more CPUs. If I have multiple CPUs in a system, that system could be designed for either symmetric multiprocessing or asymmetric multiprocessing. This is generally defined by the capabilities or limitations of the operating system itself. In a symmetric multiprocessing system, the operating system, the kernel of the operating system, automatically load balances the work that each CPU is performing inside the system. It is mildly adjustable, very slightly adjustable. This is referred to as affinity. However, all in all, the kernel of the operating system manages the load balancing of all work on all CPUs. And it's at his discretion what CPU handles what processes. In asymmetric multiprocessing mode, the operating system supports the assignment of a single CPU for a single or collection of processes. In other words, I can dedicate a CPU to the operating system. I could dedicate a second CPU to my top secret processing of data. And then a third CPU might handle miscellaneous processing so that I can now isolate uh, the core operating system some sensitive information and protect that sensitive information from lesser secure information or processes. Here's an example of a system with actually two different systems with multiprocessors. In the left we see symmetric multiprocessing where we have processor A and processor B and the operating system automatically load balances those two CPUs. And there is little adjustability that we can implement from an administrative perspective. On the right, we see asymmetric multiprocessing, where the operating system supports the ability to isolate uh, processes or operating system or programs on one or more CPUs. More definitions that we have to look at here. The first definition we want to look at is called multi-threading. Now, this is where an application can manage processing of several instructions or threads at a single time. Remember, the CPU can really only ever work on a single thread at any one instant in time. Uh, so again, this is a 32-bit application. 16-bit applications only had one thread. A 32-bit application supports multiple threads. So we're implying here when we say multi-threading uh, application that this is a 32-bit app and can support multiple threads. And the operating system can support those multiple threads. The next definition is called multitasking. Multitasking is where we can manage the processing of several programs at one time. And we say at one time. Only one of these 
programs slash processes slash threads can ever be worked on at any single point in time on a single CPU system. Uh, but because the clock rates are so high on these CPUs, it appears as though we are running two or three or ten or twenty programs at, at the same time. Multiprocessing implies that there's more than one CPU in a system. That supports multiple threads. The more CPUs, the more threads. Uh, recently, the development of the multicore CPUs has become prevalent. So these, uh, these rules we're describing here are for a single core CPU, uh, can only process a single thread at a time. With a dual core CPU, we can now process two threads simultaneously. If we do have multiprocessors, multiple processors in a single CPU, if we do have multiple processors in a computer system, we can implement either symmetric or asymmetric multiprocessing. The fourth definition we see on this screen is multiprogramming. This implies the interleaved execution of multiple programs on the operating system. This is referred to as cooperative multitasking, which we're going to take a closer look at next. Here we're looking at the difference between cooperative multitasking versus preemptive multitasking. Back in the early Windows days, Windows for Workgroups specifically, they used a uh, time sharing process called cooperative multitasking. So actually the developer, the programmer who wrote his program says, when I get my turn in the CPU, when he starts paying me attention and working on my threads, I'm going to work this many threads and then I will cooperatively give up my turn. I will relinquish control of the CPU back to the operating system so that somebody else can take a turn. What this says is a couple of things. First, it's up to the courtesy, the generosity of the programmer how often he gives up his turn. Once he start, gets his turn, he then can keep it for as long as he cares to. In other words, he could, be a, he could hog the CPU if he, if he chose to. Now, where this caused problems is that because the CPU was waiting for the program to give up its turn cooperatively, if the program locked up or had some other problem where it couldn't reach the statement that says, OK, I give up my turn, the computer system now cannot process any other programs, processes, or threads. In other words, we've just killed the box, and it requires a reboot. So back in the Windows 16-bit architecture days, the Windows 3X days, we used cooperative multitasking. And any time a single app locked up, it locked up the entire CPU, and we had to reboot the entire computer. That was unacceptable. So in the days of Windows 9X and Windows NT, the kernel of the operating system now takes control. This is referred to as preemptive multitasking. In other words, program, I don't care what you say when your turn is up. I'm in charge of this computer system, and I'll tell you when your turn is up. So in preemptive multitasking, the kernel of the operating system declares when a single process's turn is up in the CPU. And he then controls the time slicing, the sharing of the CPU processor itself. So here are some examples. With cooperative multitasking, Joe's process is only done when Joe decides it's time for him to take a pause. And then he relinquishes his turn to Harry, for example. Harry then gets his time slice, and he operates as long as he cares to until he decides to cooperatively give up his turn. He gives that turn up then to Fred, etc., etc. So it's all done cooperatively by the programmer themselves. They decide when they give up their turn. Now, with preemptive multitasking, again, the operating system is in charge of when a particular process is done in the CPU, when, it's, when that process's time slice has been completed. So the kernel rem remains in control of whose turn it is and when that turn is over. This is an example, this deadlock is an example of when a programmer hasn't written his code correctly. He's uh, implemented or designed in a vulnerability. This is referred to again as the deadlock. This is where one thread or instruction needs a resource. And he can't move forward until he acquires that resource. But a second thread 
is consuming that resource and has it locked. So the first thread can't move forward because the second thread has that resource locked. The problem is that second thread can't move forward and release that resource until he acquires a resource, which unfortunately the first thread has locked. So what we have here is a deadlock. The program has now crashed. Next we're going to look at memory. First we're going to look at memory types. So we have a definition of the different uh, stages of memory that we have in the system. Then we're going to look at how the system protects that memory. That's uh, layering and hiding t uh, techniques, which we've discussed in other domains. And then we're going to look at memory addressing. There are some definitions you'll need to know here in memory addressing. So first, let's get a definition of our memory types. We have different areas, different regions of the system that have memory requirements. And some of them are very high performance demands and others are lesser performance demands. The higher performance, of course, is more expensive. So we generally have less amount of these higher performance types of memory. That highest performance type of memory is referred to as the register or the buffer. Now remember, the registers and buffers live typically on the substrate that holds the CPU itself. Then the next level we have is cache memory. Cache memory, there are typically are two types. There's level one and level two cache. Level one cache lives on the CPU substrate with the registers and the buffers. Level two cache is generally physically and electrically close to the CPU. Then we have RAM. That's random access memory. That's what everybody's aware of. This is volatile memory that loses what it has stored every time you power down the computer system. Next we have read-only memory, ROM. Read-only memory is a programmable memory chip that is not volatile. In other words, it retains its memory even when the power to the device goes, to the device goes away. And finally, we have virtual memory. Now, because memory of all types it, are expensive, we very often need to increase the amount of memory that we have in a system, but we don't necessarily have thousands of dollars to throw at this very expensive memory. So what we do is we actually simulate memory on the very slow and very inexpensive hard drive. Hard drives are approximately one million times slower than typical RAM. So putting this in perspective, when we roll to virtual memory, that's our page file or swap file, we are dramatically degrading the performance of the system. Uh, very often, the answer to the performance question is add more RAM. So we've already looked at buffers and registers on the CPU. Next, we're going to look at the cache types. Again, as I indicated, we have a level one cache, which typically lives on the CPU itself, extremely close to the CPU, uh, electrically and physically, and very high performance. We're talking nanosecond technology. This is billionths of a second, maybe two to three billionths of a second to access the level one cache. Again, it's very expensive and typically very small amounts of memory. Then we have level two cache. As we see in the diagram, level two cache is located very close electrically and physically to the CPU, but is not actually part of the CPU. It's generally mounted on the motherboard very close to the CPU. Again, we're talking nanosecond technology, a few nanoseconds to access level two cache. Then we see read-only memory. Again, read-only memory is non-volatile. That's the important thing to remember. When we implement or when we store data into read-only memory, even if the power is turned off, that data is still there. It's left intact so that it's available the next time we power up. So our BIOS program that contains instructions on how to boot up the computer and instructions uh, drivers, if you will, for all the components on the motherboard, this lives in what's called read-only memory. Typically, it's placed in something called an EEPROM, an erasable, programmable, read-only memory chip. And finally, we'll take a look at virtual memory. Again, virtual memory is when I don't have sufficient amounts of RAM, so I simulate more RAM by creating a large page file or swap file on a hard drive somewhere. Remember, hard drives are very, very inexpensive compared to true physical RAM, but they also are very, very slow compared to true physical RAM. Now, this swapping process is controlled by one of the executive services of the operating system called the memory manager. 
specifically a subcomponent of the memory manager is called the virtual memory manager and that's the guy who keeps track of when I've run out of physical RAM and I need to make more he then pages out or takes sections of content that is in RAM that hasn't been accessed for a while and pages it in 4K pages typically out to the very slow page file that lives on the hard drive. He then keeps track of what's out there so that when we do request that information back, when we're actually trying to process that content again, he has to then page that information back into physical RAM so that the CPU can access it and begin to process it. Again, it's the virtual memory manager that manages the swapping of these pages from physical memory out to the page file and then back. When I need to create more room in RAM, this is called a page out. When I'm looking for content that has been paged out to the page file, that's called a page fault. And the page fault triggers a page in. That's when I take content from the page file on the slow hard drive and page it back into physical RAM. So when you are looking at the performance of a system, sometimes your concern will be page out, page faults, or page ins. So again, to summarize, we have different types of memory, going from fastest to slowest, most expensive to least expensive, and generally smaller amounts to larger amounts. We have the registers or buffers that actually live on the CPU substrate. We also have level 1 cache that lives on the CPU substrate typically and level 2 cache that lives very close electrically and physically to the CPU itself. Then we have main memory which would be called RAM and when we run out of RAM we then will use an area, a page file on the hard drive uh, that is notably slower but we can create gigabytes of page file space. And here again is that summary. This also adds to it some additional components such as input devices. Some of the things that the memory manager is responsible for is the actual paging out. Now again we said that was a subset of this executive service called the virtual memory manager. He's the guy who's responsible for the relocation of paged content that was in RAM and now may be living on the hard drive and he then of course is required to keep track of where it is and knows how to put it back when we need access to that information that has been paged out. The memory manager also works with the security kernel of the operating system to protect access to these components in memory. The security kernel's job is to see to it that only authorized access of the data and instructions is allowed and it's his job to actually generate errors and block access when unauthorized access is attempted. Here we see a diagram showing us the memory manager actually living between the applications and true physical RAM. When an application is launched, the memory manager allocates an arbitrary or created, fabricated numbering system addressing system for the application. So the memory manager tells the application you have the region from 6 gigabytes of memory to 8 gigabytes of memory, for example. So the application thinks he has 2 gig of true RAM that he can play with. Now the memory manager then will move the application's processes into physical RAM. And so the memory manager keeps track of the physical address and how it maps to the virtual address that was given to the application. This again is a, an example of layering and abstraction and data hiding. The application doesn't really know where to find its instruction and its data in true physical RAM. It only calls its locations by the virtual addressing scheme. So this is memory protection by virtual addressing so the application doesn't really know where his content is in true physical RAM. Further we see two different memory sticks in this diagram. This could also implement a form of physical segmentation or isolation. We could say that memory stick number one, the guy at the top, is used only for top secret data and memory stick number two, the stick at the bottom, can be used for lesser than top secret 
information and processing. So we have seen now logical isolation and layering versus physical isolation and layering. Some other memory manager responsibilities include the sharing of information. There are times where one process needs access to information that another process is working on. So we have to have programmatic channels predefined so that there are permissions allowed so that process two can access data from process one. Otherwise, the security kernel would disallow the access and would probably terminate the process that's making the unauthorized attempt. Again, we also had mentioned earlier that the memory manager's job is to provide this logical organization. In other words, uh, setting up the virtual addressing scheme, keeping it mapped, and then also making uh, links or, or connections to procedures in other areas of memory. And finally, we mentioned the physical segmentation that I described on the preceding slide. So some definitions related to memory addressing. First, we have base address. I believe in the example I described a few moments ago, I declared that application one would have an address space that starts at six gigabytes, and he could run all the way up to eight gigabytes. Six gigabytes would be his base address. Now there's another term here, it's not listed on the slide, called the limit address. The limit address is the offset or relative address from the base address. The limit address is the upper region of memory that a application is allowed to access. So we would say your base address is two gigabytes and your limit, I'm sorry, your base address is six gigabytes, that's where you'll find your processes, and your limit address is two gigabytes. So that would tell the application he could run from six gigabytes to eight gigabytes and could go no further. If he tries to touch anything in any other address space, the security kernel for the operating system would probably terminate that process. In other words, the application would be, uh, would be killed. It would no longer be functional. So we have a base address of six gigabytes. And if I needed a process that was stored at 100K above that six gigabytes, that would be the relative address. So it would be application one with a relative address of 100K. The relative address says, starting at your base address, move up. And that's where you'll find the instruction you're looking for. And finally, we have the absolute address. Now, the program or application itself doesn't ever know what its absolute address is. Remember, this is this logical segmentation that the memory manager implements between the program itself and true physical RAM. Uh, the program implements or executes its processes, loads them into RAM, but doesn't actually know truly, physically, where they're located on those memory chips. It just knows to tell the memory manager, I need an instruction from my base address plus 100K, go get me that. And then the memory manager looks at his map, identifies the absolute address or physical address where the in, in information is that the program is asking for, and then provides access to that instruction or data set. So here we see an example of the base address and a limit address. The base address would be the 30004, and limit address is how much higher am I allowed to go from that base address. So this identifies the lower and upper bounds of the memory space that an application or program is allowed to utilize. We also need to recognize that from time to time, processes need to share access to data and instructions. We also mentioned this uh, DLL, or the dynamically linked library. These libraries have shared routines. So periodically, these programs or processes need to access the same instructions from these DLLs. So we must have predefined programmatic procedures so that a process is allowed to access a process in another area of memory that is not his. So again, these have to be predefined, complete with permissions, privilege. Otherwise, the security kernel for the operating system will terminate the offending process. And that's exactly what I was describing. Memory protection, 
again, when we allocate a program, the region from 6 gigabytes to 8 gigabytes in RAM, if some other application or process attempts to, in an unauthorized fashion, access anything in that region, the security kernel for the operating system will terminate the offending application. In the Microsoft operating system, the error message reads, an application has attempted to execute an illegal instruction and has been terminated. You've probably seen that error message. That is an application or process who tried to touch something in a region of RAM that he didn't have permission to. Next, we'll talk about a memory leak. Now, a memory leak is typically the result of poor programming. This is generally where a process has requested a region of memory, in other words, a stack. He said, I need a stack, and it needs to be this large so that I can get all my instructions and all of my data into the stack. And then when the process has completed, when the CPU has actually performed the work, Unfortunately, the programmer doesn't give that stack memory back to the system. And he actually continues to collect more and more and more stacks that he never gives back. As a result, that application consumes an ever-increasing amount of RAM until the system becomes starved for memory. As a result, the performance of the system gets worse and worse, and it could actually cause the system to fail. When a bad guy finds this vulnerability, this poorly written code that's called a memory leak, the bad guy can now tickle that application into making that same request that doesn't give back the memory. He just triggers the process over and over and over again until he effectively kills the performance of the system. This is a denial of service or DOS attack. In this section, we're going to be looking at the different ways that the hardware and the operating system can isolate or segment processes, data, applications, and programs from other components inside the system. This is for security purposes. Let's keep this in mind. The whole perspective here is how to secure our processes and our data that is being worked on by the computer itself. So again, this is a combination of hardware and operating system. So first, we're going to look at uh, different levels of trust. And the more trusted a component is, the, the more resources that that component has access to. We'll look at memory segmentation. Now, we've already talked about physical segmentation, where I can isolate certain processes and data set to single CPU chips. And all other processes and data live on other CPU chips. That's physical segmentation. And then we also discussed the memory managers uh, assignment of virtual addressing to the user level application so that the application doesn't really know where it lives in true physical memory. That is again logical segmentation. These are all different versions of process and data isolation. It's all the same as layering, hiding, abstraction. We are, we are securing instructions and data sets from other instructions and data sets that might be of lesser security or might even be malicious in nature, trying to modify, corrupt, or steal that information. Then we'll look at virtual machines. Now, a virtual machine is a, a non-physical computer that lives inside the operating system already running on a computer. Now we have a host machine and that host machine can support multiple virtual machines. We'll be describing several different types of virtual machines. Uh, these virtual machines are pretend computers, if you will, that live inside this one computer. Each of those machines uh, has its own security systems and mechanisms and can perform processing in this isolated virtual machine. If there's any security breach inside that virtual machine, we simply kill that virtual machine and we have not affected the host computer at all. This also isolates that virtual machine from all other virtual machines. So again, a virtual machine is another way of uh, segmentation, isolation, layering, and hiding. Another way to abstract processes and data from other processes and data. Then we're going to look at something called the protection rings. Now these are conceptual security boundaries that are implemented 
by the CPU manufacturers and then supported by the vendors that produce operating systems. We're going to look at a four ring protection ring model. This is what is used by the Microsoft operating system on the Intel CPU. We'll be discussing this in detail. Then we're going to look at I.O. protection, input-output protection. We have to recognize that the channels that are used to input data and then receive data back out must be secured. They must be controlled. These are restricted interfaces and they are only going to provide access when the security kernel declares that it is safe for the, this access. Uh, this is again a major way that the bad guys will try to penetrate the system and or steal data from the system. Then we're going to look at the concept of the security domain. Uh, I'll give you the quick definition. A security domain is the collection of all objects that a subject can access. This is a subject's capability. Uh, this is the subject's level of privilege. This is a collection of all the things that a subject can do on a system. Whether that's a read or a write or a delete, etc. That defines that subject's security domain. One other definition, one other term that is synonymous is called the user's security profile. Again, a collection of all objects that a subject can access. So it starts with the computer itself, that is the hardware, that is the CPU and the motherboard and the system around the CPU. And then, of course, that is useless unless we have an operating system that is designed and integrated with that particular CPU. Typically, the operating system identifies two different modes to execute code. We have user mode, which is also called problem mode. This is the less trusted mode of operation. And then we have privileged mode, also called supervisory or kernel mode. This is the most trusted entity on the system. And again, putting this in perspective, the less trusted a subject is, the smaller the security domain is. In other words, if I have less trust for you, I will let you touch fewer and fewer things. If I have more trust for you, I will let you touch a greater number of objects. And again, this is what we're describing is different levels of trust for different subjects that are performing work on a particular computer system. Processes of a higher trust can access more of the system's resources and processes of a lower trust can access a smaller portion of the system's resources. And again, we've described the user mode the, in this diagram. The user mode is at the top half, the, the blue uh, section in the diagram. These are programs that the user has launched to perform the work that the user chooses to do. These are less trusted than kernel mode, that is, the components that the operating system needs to implement. These are services and e executive components that the operating system requires to keep the system functional and secure. Down below at the lowest level we have the hardware. Uh, the hardware without an operating system is uh, useless. It's not effective. It's not functional. So the hardware and the operating system pretty much has to have to live together. Here we see the diagram showing the implementation of these protection rings. Again, this is an architecture, conceptual architecture, that is implemented in the Intel CPU and then supported by the Microsoft operating system. And I say, I'm using these as, as an example. All CPUs and all operating systems implement a ring structure. In this diagram, we see a four ring structure going from ring zero at the core to ring three at the periphery. Ring zero is the most trusted region of this ring structure. This is where the kernel lives. So the most trust says the largest security domain, the greatest number of resources that that subject, the kernel, can access. Ring three is where the user lives. That's the applications that you and I launch on a computer system. We live in ring three, the least trusted region of the ring structure and as a result we have the smaller security domain and we can only access a fewer number of resources. Now we may gain additional access by making requests through the ring structure towards the inner layers 
and requesting access to some of these other resources. It is only by those executive services and the kernel of the operating system that we may or may not be granted access to those requested resources. To take this one step further, the executive services such as the memory manager and the local security authority live at ring one. Ring two is where the operating system's utilities and device drivers live. And uh, so some examples of components that live at Ring 2 are the cryptographic service provider and something we're going to bump into in a little while called the security reference monitor live at Ring 2. So the kernel lives at Ring 1. The executive services live at, sorry, I said that incorrectly. The kernel lives at Ring 0. The executive services of the operating system live at Ring 1. S operating system utilities and device drivers live at ring 2 and then all user processes live at ring 3. Ring 0 is the most trusted with the greater security domain. Ring 3 is the least trusted with the smaller security domain. And again as we've described closer to the core more trust greater access. Further away from the core out at ring 3 less trust and smaller access, uh, lesser access to resources. So this diagram shows those different security domains. Also, it identifies the need for information to flow from outer rings to inner rings. Now, this information flow, requests and, and information back out of this ring structure, is controlled through specific communications channels. These are restricted interfaces and they are referred to as application programming interfaces. Again, this is a functional tool, but it is also where we need to implement security. So they are security components as well. We only provide APIs to processes at higher layers that we choose and authorize access to. So here again we see the hardware at the lower layer, the kernel or the executive services in the mid layer, that's the operating system, and then we see the user level operating at the highest level. And again, we recognize that the user level programs need access to these internal resources that are controlled carefully by the operating system. So these requests must flow down through the specific executive services to request and then hopefully be granted access to the specific resources that the user program is, des is desiring. So again, the application programming interface is the controlled communications channel from one layer to another layer. Again, this is designed for functionality, but from a security perspective, it also must be highly secured. This is the way a bad guy will violate your security. So it's programmed communications channel between two layers and in the ring architecture or the OSI model or any other layers that we're talking about, abstraction, layering, data hiding, black boxing, all of these, the portal, the communications mechanisms from that layer to any other layer is done through an application programming interface. Again, a key point for functionality, but more importantly, a key point for security. So this should be a carefully controlled interface. We see these interfaces between layers on network components, in protocol stacks, drivers, etc. You see the list here. Again, any time we're talking about abstraction, layering, data hiding, black boxing, all of these require APIs so that the processes outside the, a particular layer can communicate with that layer so that it can get its work done and can then provide the output to the next layer as required. So we're going to take a closer look at the protection of different processes. And again, this is to ensure that one process cannot access resources in another, area, another process's memory area. Uh, so they cannot modify the confidentiality integrity or availability of that other process's information. We've already described one area of process isolation and that was with the stack. As you recall, the stack is a region of memory 
that is assigned to or allocated to a process on request of the program. It is protected by the security kernel of the operating system, and if an unauthorized process attempts to access any of the information within the stack, the system declares an error and will terminate the offending process. On occasion, this will also require termination of the violated process. Another mechanism used to provide this isolation or protection has to do with encapsulation. And again, this is the layering, the, the data hiding, the abstraction boundaries, etc. And this affords a level of what we call black boxing. A process at layer one has no idea what's happening inside of layer two. All he knows is that through a particular API, based on a certain set of rules on how the communications will flow, the layer one process will hand information through the API to layer two. And what happens inside of layer two? Layer one has no idea. So this is a way of encapsulation of these processes. Another isolation mechanism is time multiplexing of shared resources. This is where get different time slices are allocated to different processes. On a larger scale, substantially more coarse scale, we might declare that a particular computer system is available for processing of top secret data from 8 o'clock until noon. And from 1 o'clock in the afternoon until 5 p.m., we'll use that computer system for processing secret data. In other words, we would reboot into a different security mode for the afternoon period. So you see, this is a very coarse form of time multiplexing. Most of the time when we refer to time multiplexing, we're talking about milliseconds of time, where we share a resource for a few milliseconds, uh, each, each process having just those few milliseconds of, of access. We have virtual mapping. We've described this already, where the memory manager identifies to a process or a program a, a fabricated or created memory addressing scheme. This then uh, is mapped to true physical addressing by the memory manager. So this is virtual mapping. And finally, we have the name distinction way of process isolation. This is where a process is giving a specific identifier, a process ID or PID. And that process now uh, may call other processes by their process ID and share information amongst them through these programmatic application programming interfaces, but may not access processes of another process ID. So here we see two different processes accessing resources in main memory and on the hard drive, and they are carefully managed and controlled through the security kernel of the operating system. And again, if process one tried to access a region of memory or hard drive space that process two was allocated, process one would typically be terminated by the security kernel of the operating system. And here's an example of the process ID. This is a screen capture from the task manager program in a Windows operating system. And you see the second column there shows the process ID. This is a naming distinction. And as processes are launched, they may have pre-assembled channels, communications channels, so that one process ID is allowed to, in an authorized fashion, communicate with another process of another process ID. Next, we'll look at virtual machines. Again, a virtual machine is a fabricated or phony computer that is assembled inside the operating system of the host computer. Many examples of uh, virtual machines include the NT's virtual DOS machine, the NTVDM. This allows DOS applications to be run on a Windows NT box, everything from Windows NT all the way up through the current Windows Server 2003. Another example is Microsoft's virtual PC, VMware, and the Java Sandbox. These are all examples of virtual machines where to the processes inside that virtual machine, it is an entire computer dedicated to that process. However, it lives only in a host computer and is now providing a boundary or an isolation uh, boundary between the processes inside the virtual machine and the host computer, as well as between different virtual machines on the same system. So that if any one 
system has a problem, we can simply terminate that virtual machine and have no effect on the other virtual machines or on the host operating system. And here is a screen cap from the VMware application and a diagram that illustrates the example I just described. Next we'll look at input-output devices. Again, the major concept to keep in mind with I.O. devices is that this is a channel from the outside world into the processes that hold and manipulate the valuable information assets on the computer. Remember, these are all controlled through application programming interfaces, and many of these are built into the operating system. Remember, it's through the use of this polling process called interrupts that the computer system itself will recognize different processes and devices and allow them to interact with the computer system itself. This polling process is done through addressing, and we've already described this. Remember, we called these the interrupts. We had maskable and unmaskable interrupts. Uh, again, this is the polling process where the CPU polls each interrupt and sees if that particular device or process is ready for some work to be done. If not, the CPU moves to the next interrupt and simply polls around until everybody is at a, at a turn. In this diagram, we see two different types of devices that we might need to communicate with. On the left, we see a character-based device, and on the right, we see a block-based device. In other words, is this device going to send me individual characters, and I need to treat each character as a discrete entity or object or component, versus the devices on the right that use blocks of information, and I will uh, I will allow blocks of information to flow through the I.O. device, perhaps reassemble those blocks into a program or a file, and then can access the object as this now cohesive component. We described device drivers a little while ago. Device drivers live at ring 2 in the ring architecture. They are closer to the kernel of the operating system than the user, therefore they have a greater security domain, they have more privilege than the subject does, and again, these are very often mechanisms that bad guys use to infiltrate and then violate the operating system and your valuable information assets. Again, these device drivers live closer to the kernel and provide the attacker closer access to the kernel. Some devices use something called direct memory access channels, or DMA channels. This is where this device has a region of memory allocated to the device itself and can write directly without making requests to that location in memory. Again, uh, this very often is a mechanism used by bad guys to populate the computer with malware and then find some other mechanism to launch that malware. These programs and applications and processes that we use, of course, are very, very complex. I recently did a survey of my laptop, and on one of the two hard drives in my laptop, I have half a million files. Very, very complex. All the drivers, all the support files, the programs, the executables, and then, of course, my data. So we have very, very complex structures in software and operating system to provide the feature-rich capability that our programs uh, and we as users desire. These many different avenues, this very complex structure, allows many types of compromises. Uh, so let's first look at this trust hierarchy on how the operating system, how this computer system, I should say, functions. First, the user, who is at the lowest level of trust, has trust for the application that he's launching. He trusts that the application will not violate the confidentiality, integrity, or availability of the data that the application is processing. The application trusts that the operating system will support the application correctly and not violate CIRA of the data set. And then, of course, the operating system trusts the hardware. That's the physical construct that the operating system lives upon. So user trusts the app, the app trusts the OS, and the OS trusts the hardware. It's only through this trust hierarchy that we might ever 
manipulate or store our data on computer systems and have some level of confidence that our information will remain intact and available. We have the compromise from above. The compromise from above is where we have an unprivileged user. Now this is an unauthorized user. Perhaps this is a user Bobo that uh, steals Lulu's, a different user's, username and password. And then logs on as, as, as Lulu. So if Bobo logs on as Lulu, he is an unauthorized or unprivileged user. And he's now moving about with Lulu's level of privilege. Any exploits that he implements, any, any damage he introduces is a compromise from above. Compromise from within is when Lulu logs on as Lulu and somehow steps beyond the boundaries of what she should be doing. This is where a privileged user misuses their level of privilege. That's a compromise from within. And then finally, compromise from below is typically considered where we have malware or virus that embeds itself into the BIOS or firmware in a computer system and then this particular piece of software performs some damage to the confidentiality, integrity, or availability of your valuable information asset. So now that we've seen how the computer hardware and the operating system can work together to provide what we call the trusted computing base. We're going to start to look at some details on how we can evaluate and eventually certify a specific level of security that we can be assured our computer system will afford us. We're going to look at what's called the TCB or trusted computing base. We're also going to then consider something we've already talked about a few times. This is the execution or security domain. Remember, this is the collection of all objects that a subject has access to. We've also referred to this as the user profile, the user's level of privilege as well. We're also going to look at a couple of components in the operating system. We've already mentioned the security kernel, and I believe I even mentioned the security reference monitor. We'll be delineating that a, a little bit further. And then we're going to look at some details related to the security kernel that are required uh, so that this level of security can be evaluated, tested, and then certified. So the trusted computing base. This is a term coined from the Orange Book. Now, the Orange Book is a collection, it's, it's one of a, in a collection of books called the Rainbow Series that was developed by the National Center for Secure Computing, the NCSC. And the Orange Book defines if we have a computer system that we recognize is going to hold our valuable information assets, how can we be assured that this is going to maintain the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of the valuable information assets that reside on that computer system? Uh, so the Orange Book dealt with security on a single box. We're also going to discuss briefly the Red Book. The Red Book talks about the network behind the individual computers. Uh, that's referred to as the TNI, Trusted Networking Interpretation. So, the NCSC specifies uh, a list or, or several rankings of security levels that might be required in our processing and storage of our valuable information assets. Uh, as we test and certify a computer system against this standard uh, in the Orange Book, we can establish what we call the trusted computing base at a certain level of security. Again, this identifies then a rigid boundary, or fairly well-defined boundary between what lives within the TCB and what lives outside the TCB. This boundary is called the perimeter, the TCB perimeter. And this perimeter can be penetrated only through very uh, closely controlled and managed application programming interfaces. Remember, the communications channels that are used between layers. Well, here we have two layers. We have within the TCB and outside the TCB. And, of course, we then need an API so that our information can flow through that boundary and flow through a very controlled and secure manner. So here's a diagram showing uh, components that live within the TCB. Remember, as we said before, we're talking specifically about the hardware, and that would include the firmware or BIOS that lives in the, inside the computer system itself, and then, of course, the operating system that is installed on that piece of hardware. This is what lives within the TCB.
and the components that are not included in this trusted computing base must penetrate this perimeter, the TCB perimeter, through very carefully controlled APIs. One of the requirements of the TCB from the operating system standpoint is a kernel that protects itself and it also has trusted recovery, uh, trusted shell, and as it communicates with components outside the TCB, a trusted path for communication. Because if a bad guy can get between the subject and the kernel and inject his malware or uh, violate the confidentiality or integrity or availability of the information, uh, then the TCB is, is of no value. It's been exploited. So again, we need trusted path, a hardened perimeter, and system self-protection. We've pretty well defined this. This is referred to as the execution domain or a security domain. And again, what this identifies is uh, uh, the collection of all objects that a subject has access to. And uh, related to processes, let's put this in perspective, processes are only launched or can only be executed in the context of a subject's level of privilege. In other words, whoever launches the process that process carries with it that subject's access token or level of privilege. And therefore, any of its processes uh, run under the privilege level of whoever, whatever subject launched that process. Now, if a user launches the process, then the user's level of privilege is much smaller. The execution or security domain is much smaller. In other words, fewer resources can be accessed directly. If the kernel of the operating system launches the process, then of course the execution domain for this particular process is much larger because the kernel is the most trusted entity on the computer system and has access to many, many more resources. And let's also remember that it is the password, I'm sorry, the program status word, the PSW, that is the flag that identifies which execution mode the process is going to be operating within, whether it's user mode or privileged mode. So again, the execution domain or protection domain or security domain, all three of these are the same thing. This is the collection of all objects that a subject has access to. We've defined this over and over again. So what are the objectives or the functions of the TCB? First, within the TCB, we have to, in a secure fashion, be able to launch or activate processes. This is done through that polling process we called with the interrupt requests. Then we have to identify, using the PSW, which mode of operation we're running in. Are we running in user mode or are we running in kernel mode or privilege mode? So we have to identify which mode we're in and then properly and completely switch into that mode. Then we'll look at some memory protection mechanisms. And again, let's don't forget the trusted path requirements. As I am taking data in and outputting data, those paths of communications, those APIs, must remain secure. So, starting with process activation. Again, this is when we are trying to get a process uh, functioning in the CPU. We want this routine to run. We want this program to run. I need my data output from this program. This is when I need it to be activated. So what happens is this process gets assigned an interrupt and the CPU through its polling text techniques will call that interrupt and say, do you have something for me? And because our program is ready and uh, is waiting for the CPU to, to make this request, boom, our process now uh, begins to interact with the CPU and actually gets its turn in the processing channel. When the CPU has completed all the processing for this specific process, then the CPU sets a flag again and identifies that this particular process has been completed and uh, will reallocate the resources that had been assigned to this process to uh, the available pool of resources. As we recall, it was the PSW, or the the program status word that is the flag that identifies which execution domain we're going to operate in, whether it's user mode or privileged mode. And we must securely and completely switch between those two modes. Uh, otherwise, it would be possible that a user mode process uh, 
uh, may get access to information in privileged mode or vice versa. Both of these would be a violation of the TCB and would be a breach of security. So again, the security perimeter, this is the TCB perimeter, identifies very specifically a boundary that says these components within the perimeter have been tested and certified as maintaining a certain level of security and anything that is not within this perimeter can only communicate with components inside the perimeter through very carefully controlled APIs or interfaces. So as we said, this perimeter can only be penetrated through very carefully controlled application programming interfaces. This uh, API that we're talking about in, when it comes to a subject accessing an object is controlled by the security kernel of the operating system and he takes advantage of another component that lives at ring 2 of the, uh, in the ring architecture called the security reference monitor. And the whole point of this evaluation through this API as we penetrate the TCB perimeter is to ensure that the subject who is attempting to make uh, access of an object is doing it in an authorized fashion. And if the subject is an unauthorized subject making uh, this request, then the request will be denied. So again, it starts with a Ring 1 executive component called the security kernel. Again, this guy is one of the uh, main components in an operating system and it's his job to enforce all security related rules. He's the guy who protects the memory space from one for one application from another. He's also the guy that implements the security reference monitor that we're about to delineate further here. So the security kernel, a ring one component, contacts the security reference monitor, a ring two component, and says, we have a subject that's attempting to access an object. Is he allowed to? And the security reference monitor then looks at the process, that's the request itself, and looks at the access token that is associated with that process, who launched this process, and so we now get a, an identification of the subject that is making the request. Then we compare that access token to the access control list, the ACL, that lives with the object the object that the subject is trying to access. As these two components align, that is the subject's identity or access token, along with the ACL, the access control list of the object, we can now identify what level of access or privilege the subject has on that particular object. Again, this is very carefully controlled and monitored by both the security kernel and his worker, the security reference monitor. So this security reference monitor has three major requirements that must be in place for any operating system to satisfy any level of the TCB. The first rule of this security reference monitor is that it must provide isolation between subject and object and it must be tamper proof. That's rule number one. It's a boundary between subject and object and it cannot be tampered with. Rule number two is every time a subject attempts to access an object, the security kernel, security reference monitor, must be invoked and cannot be circumvented. So it's a boundary and it can't be tampered with, and it gets invoked 100% of the time, cannot be circumvented. Rule number three says it also must be small enough to be tested and verified completely and comprehensively. In other words, we have to be able to attest it and certify that it does provide this level of functionality and it does it 100% of the time. So three rules. Again, it's a boundary and it can't be tampered with, rule one. Rule number two is 100% of the accesses run through the security reference monitor and it cannot be circumvented. And then rule three says it has to be test worthy. It has to be testable. And uh, the only way that an operating system could ever comply with the requirements of the trusted computing base are if the security reference monitor satisfies these three rules. So let's pull this all together. Let's look at how a system provides a level of security that can be certified. 
So let's pull this together now and identify how a system can be certified as being trustworthy at some level of security. First, a security policy or a declaration of what level of security a system is supposed to operate at is defined and then the system must also enforce that level of security. So it's defined in its security policy and it is self-enforcing by the system. Second, it also identifies how these rules relating to security will be managed and how the system will protect itself and also how it will provide the secure access to these valuable information resources. The security reference monitor is the boundary or the API that must be passed through anytime a subject attempts to access an object and only authorized accesses will be allowed. The security reference monitor is a component of the security kernel and he is a requirement of the operating system that of course is going to be evaluated against a standard in the trusted computing base. And finally, the security kernel provides access to these processes in a secure fashion. In other words, they have boundaries between them. They are isolated from one another so that these processes cannot, in an unauthorized fashion, access another process's resources. So we have boundaries between the processes, that's all within the TCB, and then we have the security reference monitor that controls how external subjects and processes access things within the TCB, and of course the underlying operating system is self-managing. Now we're going to take a quick look at four different modes of access control methodology called Mandatory Access Control, or MAC. We've already identified the requirements, different levels of security for even a, one single system. There are times where a single system will need to handle top secret data and secret data and classified data all on the same system. So we need to be able to specify what those different security levels are and then have mechanisms in place to ensure that we are able to maintain those levels of security. Mandatory access control is a very rigid and expensive uh, access control methodology. It typically is used only by military and government networks because of its rigidity and its very high expense but it is also probably the strongest access control model that we have. So now there are four modes of operation in a MAC model. First we have the dedicated security mode. This is where all the information and all the processes on a system are at the same level of security and all the subjects that will need to access those information objects are also at the same level of security. So in a dedicated security mode, the system will only handle, for example, top secret data. As a result, because all users are top secret users, they have access to 100% of the data. That's a dedicated security mode in the mandatory access control model. Next we have the system high security mode. And as you read through those bullets, you'll notice that only the last two change. So with system high security mode, we recognize that we have different levels of security requirements for the information. That means we'll have different levels of subjects accessing those different levels of objects. And now we need to qualify what users are allowed to access which objects. So with the system high security mode, all users can access some data, but it's based on their need to know. So it's more than just they're at the same level, such as top secret. Now we have top secret and they have to be working on the Afghanistan project, for example. So they need uh, the same level of clearance, but they also have a need to know. And we might have other pieces of data that are top secret, but not related to Afghanistan. Therefore, the first subject that I described would not be able to access that second piece of data.
So, dedicated security mode, all users have the same level of access on all the information. On system high security mode, users are all at the same level of clearance, but they have different levels of need to know. And as a result, they might be prohibited from accessing some of the information. On compartmented security mode of mandatory access control, all users have the same clearance and they may have the same need to know, but they also need formal access approval. So you see we're adding another variable here, and this becomes more and more complex if you haven't noticed. So the security system on a compartmented security mode system is substantially more complex than either of the first two we described. And finally, the multi-level security mode adds one more variable. All users have the same clearance level. They all have a specific need to know. They all have the same formal access approval. And now we have different levels of clearance, all on the same system. So we have clearance, need to know, and formal access approval now pulled into this. And again, these are all variables that tie together to make this a more complex, more sophisticated, more difficult security model to implement. So to summarize, we have the dedicated security mode where all users are all at the same clearance level. And they can access 100% of the information on that system. System high security mode, all users have the same clearance level, but their need to know is different. Compartmented, all users have the same clearance level and have differing levels of need to know and have differing formal access approvals. And finally, in multi-level security mode, we have differing levels of clearance, differing uh, categories for the need to know, and differing access approvals. Next, we're going to look at implementing security within an enterprise. And it isn't, it isn't the perspective of add a firewall here, or let's use stronger deadlocks, uh, deadbolts on, on the doors. It's more of a complete integration of security within the, within the enterprise. It's designed in from the start. So again, the enterprise security architecture uh, is integrated and it permeates the entire organization. It deals with the personnel, the information systems, the processes. And these are all carefully intertwined with security in mind. This, of course, must also satisfy the business needs of the enterprise, of the organization. Remember, the CISSP certification is a business-oriented certification. As a result, we always must keep in mind what the nature of the business is and maintain that proper business is being performed. Truly, this is all about ensuring and maximizing the profits of the organization while maintaining security. And again, the enterprise security architecture is designed to help optimize uh, the security of the organization, of the enterprise, so that we can uh, endure a long, productive, and financially beneficial business. So what does the enterprise security architecture Desire. What are the hopes of it? What are the objectives of this architectural design? First, it's an overall big picture view of security for the organization. It informs the business makers and teaches them how to make proper business decisions, integrating the business needs with the needs for security for that organization. By doing this, we minimize risks. It also minimizes costs related to losses associated with uh, exploits or violations of our security perimeter. Uh, again, it is a business-oriented objective, requirement, and uh, while we do implement technology, we don't simply say we should have a firewall. We should recognize that our business needs uh, dictate security for our network on the perimeter, and as a result, the firewall is the answer. It isn't the initial point, but it is the solution to the business-oriented problem. And finally, it allows us to uh, satisfy many other business-related objectives, such as um, regulatory compliance and uh, the need for auditing and record keeping uh, for these regulatory and legal-related requirements. So if we don't integrate security 
through the construction of this business, we have numerous problems that will result. First, it leads to ongoing confusion. We might put out a fire here and put out a fire there, but we aren't solving the overall security needs and objectives of the organization. So it is nowhere near as cohesive and linear as it would be if it were integrated from the de uh, design point on. It requires that we develop architectural principles. Now this is the definition of what are our security requirements. What level of security should we be maintaining? This is often referred to as the tone at the top or the company's security posture. So senior management identifies what our posture will be regarding security. Uh, the nature of a company that produces bubblegum is a very different security model than that that makes weaponry for the military. So we have to identify what level of security our organization needs. Then we build into that a model. Now the security model might identify different security levels for different facets of our organization. And they could be process related, they could be uh, physical locations that one facility needs a higher level of security than another level. So we have to model what the security needs are physically for the organization. And then finally, we need to develop the uh, security architectural methods. How are we going to implement those levels of security that are required in those places defined by the model? So the architecture methods will help me map that out. What technology solves what particular security problem? We also must evaluate what level of specificity is required as we're developing this plan. In some areas, we'll be discussing the organizational security policy. Now, the organizational security policy was very high level and abstract and defines in very general terms what our security requirements are going to be. But as we get down to more system-specific and process-specific security policies, we will be identifying discrete, specific technologies that we'll be implementing to satisfy a specific security-related issue. So there will be a balance. Many components will be very specific, many components will be very general, and we'll have to understand where we need to apply the more general and where we need to apply the more specific. So in order to implement enterprise security architecture, we need to do it at four different levels. First we have the strategic alignment. This is where we take the high level view of the business, the enterprise itself, and we evaluate where we need security and what level of security. So that's the strategic alignment as I begin to uh, have everyone in the organization recognize the need for security. And uh, then we look at process enhancement. This is where we actually infuse specific processes with security components to help us ensure that those processes will remain secure. Further, we look at the business enablement. Now, this kind of lives between strategic alignment and process enhancement. So uh, it might have been better as a second bullet. But uh, business enablement is where we actually start to look at specific modules within the organization, within the enterprise, and identify where that facet of my business needs security, at what level of security, and how we might implement security to satisfy those needs. And finally, once we get security permeating the organization, we must always be monitoring and auditing and evaluating how effective is our security because it's a continuously refined system. We're always evaluating where we've missed something or where we've had an exploit and firming up our security in those arenas so that these exploits don't happen over and over again. So again, strategic alignment is the big picture view where we analyze what is required throughout the organization as far as security is concerned. Now this starts at senior management. They are ultimately responsible for the security posture of the organization. They will typically hire someone like you and me to advise them on how to implement security within the organization. So they will assign to us the formal responsibility and authority as well as accountability for the overall implementation of security for the organization.
again, it must be driven by senior management. Oh, one other thing, they also afford us the budget to implement that security program. Then we look at the current security profile. Where are we vulnerable? What are the threats that will negatively affect the confidentiality, integrity, and availability of my valuable information assets? We, once we recognize what those threats are, we identify countermeasures that might help to mitigate the risk of those threats actually uh, causing us a loss. So we begin to identify what bad things can happen and what level of exposure is acceptable to us. Again, that level of exposure that is acceptable is defined by senior management. And finally, we'll look at uh, the security strategy. This deals with what are the needs of the business, first of all? Remember, the whole point of this is to keep the company alive and profitable, maximizing profits for as long as we can keep the company alive. We also then need to be considered with uh, regulatory and legal issues. If we have compliance requirements uh, for our industry, those are paramount. Those are standards and they cannot be violated. So we always have to incorporate them 100% into our security program. And we must recognize that this typically is a three-year program to fully develop and implement a security program. The second phase of this is the business enablement. Now that we've identified where we are vulnerable, where we need to implement new countermeasures, and we've already gotten the authority and the awareness of the organization to implement the security program, uh, it's time to start implementing. So here is where we are now starting to infuse the entire organization with the concepts of security. And that uh, includes all the individual people from management all the way down. Remember, management is the enforcer all the way down to end user security awareness training. And we identify what specific pieces of technology will be required to implement security for our organization. Uh, basically, it is an end-to-end -end process from start to finish for the organization on the implementation of the security program. We will look at permeating processes with security as well. These processes are small subsets, small little pieces inside the larger picture that we just looked at in business enablement. So now we're drilling down to a finer level of detail. Specifically, what do I need to do here? Specifically, what do I need to do over there? So again, this is a very fine level of detail at the process level and how will we implement the proper level of security there while maximizing the company's profits. In order for me to implement this process enhancement with security, we generally will require multiple security professionals in the organization. Uh, each of these security professionals will have specialized skills related to different facets of security. Some of them will be IT related security specialists. Some of them will be physical security specialists and others. So again, this is a collection of security professionals, each with their own specific facets of skill and training and responsibility. These are referred to as centers of excellence. And ultimately what we'll recognize is that security is implemented in layer upon layer upon layer. And it's because the bad guys only need to find one way in. You need to defend against every imaginable way. So what do you need to do? You need to implement multiple layers of security, uh, protecting in many, many different ways. Finally, after we've implemented the security, we need to grade ourselves. We need to monitor and audit and evaluate how well are we doing. In some areas, we've done very, very well. Perhaps we've even gone overboard. We should recognize that as well. This is wasted resources. In other areas, we've missed the boat completely, and now we recognize that we need to implement another level or layer of security to satisfy the security needs of the organization. We should always be evaluating internally in other words, we double check ourselves to make sure we're doing it correctly. But then we should always get an external pair of eyes, some third party uh, to look over our shoulder and evaluate because very often we get tunnel vision. We knew we had a specific problem to solve here and while we were so busy solving this one problem, we overlooked completely a problem in another area. It's this external, this third party pair of eyes uh, doing the monitoring and auditing that might help us uh, expand our vision
on security and allow us to build a more cohesive and complete security program. We'll also be looking at uh, different types of self-assessments. One of them is called the vulnerability scan. Now the vulnerability scanning is generally a more complete overview of where are we vulnerable. And this is everything from natural disaster to hacker attack on our websites to employee stealing proprietary data and selling it to my competition, uh, including what are we disposing of? What are we throwing away that we shouldn't be just throwing away in the dumpster because it contains confidential information? So all of these fall within the arena of vulnerability testing. Penetration testing is a subset of vulnerability testing. Penetration testing is generally considered to be trying to break into your own network and applications to identify where they are vulnerable. Penetration testing can also take on a physical form, but again, penetration testing is a subset of vulnerability testing. And then finally, we should always be testing our applications to ensure that they don't have vulnerabilities as well. Applications are typically one of the least secure components in our entire information system. And as a result, it would be better if we could identify where these vulnerabilities are first before the bad guys find them, break in and steal our valuable information, and then we're uh, worried about patching and, and disaster recovery rather than being proactive, identifying these vulnerabilities up front and eliminating them before they ever become exploited. And as we can see here that we must integrate all of these components together. First, it starts with the security foundation. The security foundation is based on ISO standard 17799. Uh, again, this is, the, this is the rewrite of the British standard 7799 chapter 1. This is also what we've come to know as the common book of knowledge. This is what the CISSP is based upon. General security principles. How do we implement security in our organ organization? Then, what, now that we ha have this book, if you will, of security standards, we need to align the organization strategically to comply with that book and, and work with it uh, so that we infuse security throughout the entire organization. And that includes both, both business enablement and process enhancement with security components infused into both of these aspects of my organization. And then, of course, we need to monitor and evaluate how are we doing. This is where we implement security effectiveness with our own auditing department and our continuous monitoring and reevaluation. Are we secure? Are we doing this thing right? So how do we pull all this together? Very carefully. It has to be done correctly at every stage. Any one stage done incorrectly, and we might as well just not have ever started. So it requires a complete linear and cohesive security program with internalize and externalize, evaluating, monitoring, and refining the security processes within the organization. This is one of the models that help us map through the, the implementation of enterprise security architecture. It looks at the who, what, where, when, why, and how we will implement security on information assets in a contextual manner, conceptual man manner, logical, physical, manner at the component level and at the operational level as well. So this is again a security model to help us implement and evaluate our enterprise security architecture. This model is based more on an industrial model. This is not the CISSP model as we saw in the preceding slide. This is a non-CISSP model, but if you consider this, they have the same problems. And as a result, they have many, many of the same solutions. And while they may slice and dice the boundaries a little differently, the overall objectives are largely the same. So regarding our three-year security development program, we first start with the buy-in. We have to recognize that we need to implement a security program in our organization. Senior management hires us and assigns us the responsibility, the authority, and of course the budget to design and implement a security program. So we design the principles, the strategy, and the policy, the written policy, and that defines then the security architecture for the organization.
Next, we'll deploy or implement the organizational structure for security, and that includes the technical framework that goes along with that security in the organizational structure. Once we have this in place, now we can identify what a security standard is, a baseline. Remember, a baseline is a threshold, and if the baseline is exceeded, then we have an incident, and this requires an investigation. We also then can lend ourselves towards a higher level of auditing, compliance, and certification to give us a level of assurance that our security is effective and complete. We also need to recognize different areas or aspects, facets of our organization have differing security demands. In the example here we see we have the public internet at the top with a DMZ, de demilitarized zone, in the middle. This is where our publicly facing web resources are provided to the internet. And then we have another section uh, behind the second firewall, which we would consider the most trusted region of our enterprise. And as we can see, we have many different facets of our network and we have many different technological tools and components and processes to help me implement and ensure security for all those valuable information assets that are flowing across these wires. In addition to the requirement for implementing security at the infrastructure level, we also have to recognize that modern day technology says that our valuable information assets will be stored and secured and processed by applications. And our applications, therefore, must also be permeated with security. Applications are made up of smaller subsets or components within the application. And these components are the ones that contain most of the vulnerabilities to our valuable information assets today. Secure coding would drastically reduce the attack face of our corporate networks and valuable information assets. We also must implement security at the business process layer. As we described earlier, these business processes are very specific, discrete steps that are performed within the organization, and so we would, should have a very specific collection of security components that would be implemented here. And when I say security components, I'm not talking specifically about devices. I may, it might be a process or a procedure that should be followed, a step-by-step -step procedure to help me implement security at each stage of the process. What it boils down to is we have to consider security at every facet. And we comb it through this way, and then we comb it back through that way, and we look at it from many different angles to try and identify the angles that the bad guys might figure out and exploit us in the unforeseen vulnerabilities. Our job is to find those vulnerabilities first so that we can be proactive about security rather than reactive to security. Now, this section poses huge problems for most students. Uh, this deals with the academic security models. These, in many cases, are formal mathematical proofs of security, how to implement security. And when I speak about security here, I'm talking about discreetly confidentiality on some models and integrity on some other models. Generally speaking, these academic mathematical formal models don't deal with providing availability. So we're going to be looking again at these abstract mathematical formal models that help to define how you will satisfy different security objectives. So the first thing we're going to look at is the security model itself. Again, it's a formal mathematical summation of if we had a specific security objective such as confidentiality, how would you implement your security so that confidentiality of information will be retained? We'll look at other models that deal with satisfying the security objective of integrity. And again, mathematically proven in many cases how you might implement your security so that integrity of information can remain high. So to implement these formal models, what we do is identify what the security needs are for a specific process or program or system and then we take pieces and parts from each of these academic models and put them together in a hybrid fashion. N not necessarily 
using all the components from any one model. I'll take pieces as I need to satisfy a specific business objective. Remember, this is a business-driven certification. So I'll pull these pieces together in bits and pieces and implement them in my programming code or the operating system code or even in hardware perhaps to ensure that I've satisfied the specific security objectives that this particular process or system demands. Now these models are based on a couple of foundational components. The first foundational component that these academic models deal with is the concept of the state machine. Uh, the state machine is, uh, again, a mathematical model that says, or it recognizes, that many different things can happen. Uh, programming is a very versatile process, and there's no telling what processes and programs will be created over the next five years or 50 years or 500 years. In other words, we could uh, evolve into a state where we have many, many, perhaps even infinite possible worlds of state on any computer because of the, the evolution of how programming works. And the state machine further then says that in order for us to implement security at, in any manner on a system that is maintaining our valuable information assets, we have to ensure that the last two bullets here, that if a machine comes up in a secure state and all state transitions are secure, including devices and programs that fail. And if the machine can also shut down in a secure state, then the system will remain secure. So that says, power up securely, do whatever you have to do, even if it's fail, do that securely and shut down securely. And what you have is a foundation for an operating system and applications that can remain secure. So to summarize again, the bottom bullet now, no matter what input, output, or processing tasks that take place, all states will remain secure. These are the fundamental concepts of the state machine. And again, these mathematical models enhance this state machine. We say we have this foundational concept of security no matter what happens. Now with that in mind, the machine itself, the computer and the operating system themselves will remain secure. Now I can build upon that. All right, let's add a user into this and some programs into this. And now we can start to implement this higher level of security once we have this foundational state machine below us. A second model that is considered foundational to the majority of these other academic models is the information flow model. And the very top bullet on this slide tells us that information must flow security, uh, securely through a state machine. In other words, as it's transitioning from one state to another state, it will remain secure. See, the state machine said, as we're at this state or that state, we'll be secure. What about the in-betweens? So these two work together to ensure that in this model, as the machine powers up and it's at a secure state and then we start to manipulate the data and at the end point of each of those manipulations it's secure and information flow says and even as we're manipulating that data all the information will remain secure. Now we have again this foundation that we can build these higher level models such as the Bella Podula and the Biba which we'll be talking about shortly. So again, the two things to remember about the information flow model is information must flow securely through a state machine system. And we recognize that these transitions will be only four in nature. They will be input to output, input to the next system state, state to state, and state to output. Those are the only four ways that information can flow through a system. And as long as we can ensure that that flow is secure, and we perform that flow on a state machine, which defines the states are secure, we know that we have a secure system. And again, now we can implement higher level security mechanisms. So to take the information flow model a step further, it specifically identifies that if data can flow from object A to object B, this is defined as explicit flow, and we have implicit flow if data can flow from object A to object B and then can securely flow from B to object C. Now data has flowed from object A to object C in a secure manner. Again, this is called implicit flow as we get from A to C.
So finally, we're looking at the first of these models that live on top of the state machine and the information flow model. It's called Bell Lapondula. A couple of key things to remember about Bell Lapondula. First, it addresses only confidentiality. It does not deal with integrity or availability. So we're dealing only with confidentiality and this also is based on a lattice which is used in a mandatory access control model which means it's used by military and government typically because of its high level of rigidity and very high cost. Most businesses couldn't justify the cost of mandatory access control models. So again, Bella Podula is a confidentiality model based on mandatory access control, MAC, mand uh, mandatory access control, and uses the lattice. So we'll be looking at how to implement confidentiality in a lattice-based security system. Again, these models are largely mathematical, formal models that deal with uh, uh, implementing these specific security objectives, in this case, confidentiality. And again, you recognize that it says uh, the basic security theorem says any activity will always result in a secure state. What does that sound like? That says if we have a state machine, we can now do Bell Podula, which is kind of on top of that state machine. So the state machine is a requirement of the Bell Podula model. With the Bell Podula model, it deals with a subject's clearance. Now that's a label that gets assigned to the subject. This clearance label aligns to an object's classification label. So again, we put labels on subjects, a clearance label, and we put classification labels on objects. And when the clearance label matches the classification label, information can flow. And I say that, that's not complete yet. Because in addition to clearance and classification, the subject also needs a need to know and the object has a category. Usually these two are required as well. They must align as well. While you might be a top secret guy looking at top secret data, if you're not dealing with Afghanistan, your need to know says you cannot view Afghanistan category of object. So again, this deals with these clearance labels and classification labels. Bella Podula has three rules that you'll need to know. The first rule regarding confidentiality says if you have a clearance label at this layer, if confidentiality is my concern, it would violate confidentiality if you could read more confidential data. In other words, data at a higher level of security. So the simple security property says you cannot read data from a higher layer if our concern is confidentiality. That's all it says. It says, if you're at this layer, you are not allowed to read data from a higher layer. That's the no read up, the simple security policy. By the way, the uh, simple is regarding the read component. So simple and read go together. So again, simple security property says, if you're at this layer, you're not allowed to read objects at a higher layer. This protects the confidentiality of those more secure objects. The second property that we deal with is called the star property. The star property deals with writing and the star property says regarding confidentiality if you're at this layer in the mandatory access control model and confidentiality is our concern you're not allowed to write objects to a lower layer. In other words you're not allowed to tell them our secrets. So the star property says no write down. And, and again, this solely protects the confidentiality of information. This is a separate rule than the simple security property and sometimes is used and sometimes is not used together with the simple security property. The third property that we need to deal with is called the strong star property. Now, to review, simple says no read up, star says no write down. What the strong star property says is you are constrained within your layer. Not only can you not read up, you're not allowed to read down. And not only can you not read down, I'm sorry, write down, you're not allowed to write up either. So you are constrained within your layer. No reading or writing of any objects other than those within your layer. That's the strong star property. So you need to know these three rules. No read up, no write down, and the strong star property says you are constrained within your layer.
This diagram shows this. Again, the simple security property says to protect confidentiality of information, you cannot read objects at a higher layer. To protect confidentiality, the star property says you are not allowed to write information to lower layers. Otherwise, you are divulging our secrets. And finally, the strong star property says you're not allowed to read or write to any layer except the one that you live in. Now, the tranquility property of Bell Lapodula is basically a measure of resistance to change or inertia. The tranquility property says once a label gets affixed to a subject or an object, that that label is very, very difficult to change. So strong tra tranquility says security levels do not change at all for the lifetime of the system. Strong tranquility says maximum inertia, maximum resistance to change. Once we stick a label on an object or a subject, it's there forever. The weak tranquility property says I can change these labels, but I can only change them in a way that does not violate the security of the system. So it's difficult to make these changes, but it is at least possible to make changes. Now, BIBA uh, is again another formal academic model. It deals with integrity specifically, and specifically not confidentiality. With BIBA, our concern is not keeping information secret. It's keeping information accurate, protecting the integrity of the information. So some fundamental rules of the BIBA integrity model. Again, first, it's an integrity model. Second, it is based, again, on the lattice structure, which is used by mandatory access control, military government, very rigid, very expensive and again deals with only integrity. It says no subject can depend on an object of lesser integrity. That says if you were at a certain layer in a mandatory access control model, you're not allowed to see anything down below. We're going to look at some of these rules in a moment, but that's what this first bullet is saying because that's not necessarily the truth. We have higher integrity at our level. Our information is more accurate at our level. It's even more accurate at higher levels but we're trying to identify the lower boundary here with this first bullet. Again, it's based on the lattice structure for security, which goes along with mandatory access control models. And it also identifies the need for authorized users to only make correct and safe modifications of the data. In other words, if you're an unauthorized user, you're not even allowed to touch the data. If you're an authorized user, you have to modify the data only where it improves or maintains the same level of accuracy. Again, our objective relative to integrity is to have a higher level of confidence in the accuracy of the information. And again, in our modern world, we recognize that our information is stored and secured and modified or processed by computers and programs. So we tuck this all into that arena, computers and programs and operating systems. So it is through these programs that we re require this higher level of the maintenance of integrity. Data at a higher level in this model is more accurate. Data at a lower level is less accurate. So three rules you need to know about BIBA. BIBA, again, is integrity, MAC, lattice, military government, expensive, rigid, but dealing with integrity, the rule is, since my information at my level is of lesser integrity than at a higher level, I'm not allowed to write information to a higher layer. So the star integrity axiom says I am not allowed to write information to a higher layer. This is to protect the integrity of the information at that higher layer. It won't let me poison their information. So again, star relates to writing. The star integrity axiom regarding integrity deals with not polluting the integrity of the information at the higher layer. The second rule that we need to learn is called the simple integrity axiom. Simple again regards reading. And to protect the integrity of my data, I'm not allowed to read the garbage they have down below. No read down. So they won't pollute my information. I'm not allowed to read their less accurate information than me, than mine. 
And finally, the third rule that we need to memorize is the invocation property. Now, what this says is, again, to protect the integrity of information. I'm not allowed to pollute the information at a higher layer by requesting some other subject improperly modify that data at the higher layer. So the invocation property says a subject cannot send requests to subjects of a higher layer of integrity. In other words, I can't tell him a lie which will cause him to modify information at this higher layer incorrectly. So again, it's all about protecting the integrity of the information. You need to know these three rules. So the next model we're going to look at is called Clark Wilson. Clark Wilson is another integrity model, but this one is different. This one is a commercial integrity model. Remember, the BIBA integrity model was a mandatory access control model, and mandatory access control model is basically used in military and government. This one is different. This one deals with commercial integrity instead of this higher level of integrity requirements that the government might have. Uh, basically, the Clark Wilson model is based on the principle of least privilege and uses a non-discretionary type of access control. So it satisfies the consideration or the principle of least privilege and does not specifically use discretionary access control uh, another model, access control model that we'll be looking at. So the goals of the Clark Wilson model. First, it again recognizes that we're going to we're going to have subjects using programs to access objects. Well, that those programs must include well-formed transactions that maintain the internal and external consistency of the data that is being stored, secured, and processed by the program. So the, the Clark Wilson model requires well-formed transactions. It also requires the separation of duties because separation of duties is one of the tools we use to minimize the potential for fraud. In other words, some guy can't cook the books. If we have three people that are part of the processing of our books, it's very difficult for one guy to modify the books incorrectly, uh, resulting in theft or violation of the integrity of our information. What would have to happen is the other two people would need to join into this process of fraud, and this is referred to as collusion. Now, collusion doesn't defeat fraud, but what it does is it makes it substantially more detectable. So if three people are required to commit the fraud, this is a much easier detection than if only one guy has enough authority to commit the fraud. So again, uh, the Clark Wilson model says well-formed transactions. That means internal consistency says the program adds two and two and gets four every time. And external consistency says when Bobo sells four widgets, he logs in that he sold four widgets. He doesn't log in that he sold two widgets and then pockets the profit or the price of the other two widgets that, that just left with the customer. So well-formed transactions require internal and external consistency to protect the integrity of the data, and separation of duties defeats fraud or re reduces fraud, minimizes fraud, and uh, helps me ensure the integrity of our information. There are five major components to the Clark Wilson model. First is the user. The user is the subject. That is the entity that is desirous of the information contained in the object. So the user is the active agent that needs the information. Then there are transformational procedures. Now this is the process that is accessing or manipulating the information. Accessing could be read or write, and uh, the manipulation is a modification of the information. So these transformational procedures can either be run through or, or be performed on constrained data items or unconstrained data items. So constrained data items would be uh, items that are closely controlled, therefore constrained, and can only be manipulated by these transformational procedures. In other words, these well-formed transactions. And this will help ensure that those constrained data items will have a higher level of integrity. 
Now, the unconstrained data items, in addition to being modifiable by these transformational procedures, can also be directly manipulated by the user. In other words, it's not so tightly controlled. So the unconstrained data items have a lesser level of integrity than a constrained data item. And then to further ensure the integrity of the information, we have IVPs, or integrity verification procedures, that act along with the transformation procedures on constrained data items. So the more secure route is the transformational procedure on constrained data items followed up by an audit trail, if you will, of integrity verifi verification procedures on those constrained data items. The ones that have lesser level of integrity are the unconstrained data items that the user can actually manipulate directly. And this model identifies the components of the Clark-Wilson model. Uh, in this diagram, it shows the user directly modifying the unconstrained data items, and the user can only modify constrained data items through these well-formed transformational procedures or transactions, and they too are audited by these integrity verification procedures. These are components of the program that we described earlier, the application that is used to store, secure, and modify or process the information. So again, Clark Wilson is based on this access triple principle, that a subject must use a program to access and modify an object. So that's the three pieces of the triple. The subject uses a program to modify an object. Subject, program, and object. Those are the three pieces of the access triple. You need to know the access triple. Further, it also requires the separation of duties. Uh, which again m reduces or minimizes the opportunity for fraud and again recognizes that we're going to be accessing the data through programs and follows up with an audit trail to verify the integrity of the information. The Clark Wilson model has three integrity goals as well and if you think these through you'll say yep that, they make sense so it's kinda like you don't need to memorize these because they make sense. The first integrity goal says if we have an unauthorized user, we have to prevent him from making any modifications. Unauthorized users cannot make modifications. Rule number one. Rule number two says I have to ensure internal and external consistency. Again, internal consistency says that a program that is adding numbers adds them correctly. And if it's multiplying numbers, it multiplies them correctly. That's internal consistency. External consistency has more to do with data input. That says if Bobo sells 10 widgets, he writes down that he sold 10 widgets. He doesn't write down that he sold 5 widgets and then pockets the money for the other 5. He sells 10 widgets, he inputs that he sold 10 widgets. That's external consistency. So rule 2 says internal and external consistency is maintained. And rule number three says, if I have an authorized user that is going to be making changes to the data, he is not allowed to make improper changes to the data. In other words, an authorized guy can't cook the books. Even if he's allowed to be in there, he still has to input data correctly. So authorized users cannot make improper modifications. That's rule number three. You need to know these three rules. Now, another model is called the non-interference model. And this model is based on those security domains or execution domains or process domains that we described earlier. Remember, the domain is the collection of all objects that a subject has access to. And the non-interference model says that if a subject is accessing an object in his domain, that modification of his objects can in no way affect your objects. So the non-interference model says whatever they're doing over there it cannot affect what you're doing over here. So to summarize a user's actions in one security domain cannot affect or interfere with users in another security domain. Now if we're talking about the lattice structure then a specific example could be a subject cannot be influenced by the behavior of other subjects at higher security levels. In other words, their information can't interfere with my information, and mine cannot interfere with theirs as well. But we also may look at this in another arena where we aren't 
necessarily in the lattice. Whatever I have access to, whatever I'm doing to my information, cannot affect the integrity of your information. So here we're going to start to delineate a little further, or perhaps once again, the lattice-based access control model. And let's keep this in mind. This is typically used with mandatory access control models, again, used on military and government networks and information systems because of its very, very rigid level of security and its very, very high cost. Um, it def describes an upper bound and a lower bound. What do we just say? Layers or lattice that this model delineates. And it will then identify a label for a subject, a clearance label for subjects, and a classification label for the objects. When these two labels align, in other words, you're a top secret guy looking at top secret data, information can flow. Uh, other examples of how this model works, uh, as we see in the diagram here, in the, in the slide here, confidential information can flow to an object or subject that is working at the same level. In this case, the class of secret, the layer called secret. In another example, we might say that information can flow from a lower layer to a higher layer. This would be more of a confidentiality model because what they know down there, I'm allowed to know up here. So they can send information up. I can't send information down, though. That would violate confidentiality. So that's a second example of how this lattice-based access control model might work. Again, these are just examples. I'm not defining anything about the way information flows within that, that model, other than uh, uh, these are some examples of how we might set up the rules to allow that information to flow. So with the lattice model, Every pair of elements, that's a subject and an object, has a label, and it is delineated by an upper bound and a lower bound. This defines your layer in this lattice. And we combine the clearance and the need to know labels with the classification and category labels of the object, and when they align, information can flow. So in this example, again, this is just another example, we have a subject named Kathy who has a top secret clearance and a need to know for Iraq and Korea. Well, as Kathy attempts to access content, an object named file B, and confidentiality is my concern, because file B lives at a secret layer rather than the top secret layer, for confidentiality reasons, Kathy, the subject, is allowed to access the object. For confidentiality as a concern, I'm allowed to read lower layer content. But I'm not allowed to write to that lower layer. Because if top secret writes to secret, we might be divulging uh, confidential information. So again, Kathy would be allowed to read file B, but would not be allowed to write to file B. And again, this is only the example where our concern is confidentiality. This, of course, would violate integrity rules. Kathy would be allowed to write to file B for integrity rules. Another type of security model is called the access control matrix model. The access control matrix model is used primarily in discretionary access control models. This is what we use on most of our commercial networks using Microsoft Windows operating system or perhaps Unix or Linux or even the Macintosh. They all principally use the access control matrix model. Now, this is where we have a subject who gets identified and gets assigned an access token. Objects have something called the ACL or access control list. This access control list that is bound to the object contains a list of all the subjects and their level of access. That's what the ACL contains. So we're going to now look at a diagram that helps us further describe this. This diagram shows us the access control matrix. And as we look, we see in the very first column, we see a list of subjects. And that first column is subjects. Uh, second column is an object, an object called file one. Further, the privileges granted to the subjects for file one in the column are referred to as the access control list for file one. 
So the access control list is bound to the object. And if we look at a row in this table, we see that a subject's row is the subject's capability. So the row is the capability, and capability is bound to the subject, while the column is the object's access control list. The ACL is bound to the object. Again, this is used primarily in discretionary access control models, which is principally what we use on Microsoft networks, Unix and Linux networks, etc. Another model we're going to look at now is called the Brewer-Nash model. This model is also referred to as the Chinese wall. This model was implemented to ensure fair competition and eliminate the possibility for conflict of interest. What this model is based on is context, not content. So if you see any questions related to uh, access controls based on context, the Brewer-Nash model or the Chinese wall model is a model that builds its rules based on context. And here's the context we're talking about. Again, this was designed to avoid a conflict of interest. So the rule says that if a subject has not accessed any company's data, he's allowed to access any company's data. But as soon as he accesses one company's data, the Brewer-Nash model builds a Chinese wall. It dynamically implements ACLs, or an access control list, that says the subject is now only allowed to access that first company's data and is not allowed to access any other company's data. So until he commits on one of the company's set of data, he can access any of them. But once he accesses any one company's data, the Chinese wall pops up dynamically and says, you can only now look at that company's data and you cannot look at any other company's data. And again, this was designed uh, for a commercial model to avoid conflict of interest concerns. So again, this was a way of separating competitors' data within the same integrated databases, such as on the stock market or uh, something along those lines. And again, the things to remember here is it is context-based. It's to avoid conflicts of interest. It's a commercial model. And it dynamically assembles ACLs to disallow a subject to access other companies' information. Another model we need to know something about is called the Tate Grant. This may also be called the grant take. Now, those aren't two people. This is a model that identifies a framework for granting and then removing or revoking those access permissions. So again, this is implemented uh, not to provide a certain access or de deny a certain access, but it's the mechanisms to grant or revoke those access privileges. This model is also used in the testing of other access control models to ensure that if I grant these three permissions, do I really get just those, or does it somehow allow me to get other accesses? So again, this is a, another formal mathematical model, academic model designed to teach us, to, to give us rules on how we should be granting and revoking privileges for users' accessing of objects. Another rule is, or a model is called the Graham-Denning model. Now, this model is designed to help us manage subjects and objects and the granting or management of access privileges. So that's principally what Graham-Denning model deals with, is the management of subjects, the management of objects, and the management of granting or managing access privileges. So this last section in the domain comes to the grand conclusion about the domain. Remember, when I started this domain, I described the whole point of this domain was based on the recognition that today our valuable information assets are stored, secured, and processed on computers. And that if we intend to keep that information secure, our computers must somehow be identified as secure. And how do we do that? Well, first, they have to be designed, and then manufactured, and then delivered, and then installed, 
and then maintained securely. And we looked at how to secure the hardware, how to design it properly, uh, how to take advantage of segmentation and isolation boundaries. We looked at the operating system with its ring architecture and how those rings afforded us another level of isolation and boundaries, layering, data hiding. Then we looked at the integration of security in the enterprise as it uh, needs to permeate all facets of the enterprise. And then we looked at some of the formal models that our higher level security systems are based upon. Well, now that we have all this foundation in place, we can now boil this back down to the real world, how do we turn that into knowing that a computer system that I'm going to purchase has some certifiable level of security? This is done through these components that we're looking at here. It started with the Trusted Computer System Evaluation Criteria, or the TICSEC. That was the U.S. government recognizing the need for different levels of security on different computer systems in different roles and how to specify them and then get them certified at that level of security. The next one down is the Information Technology Security Evaluation Criteria or the ITSEC. Now this was a European enhancement to the US TICSEC. It came a handful of years later and they basically took what TICSEC was and expanded it to try and give more versatility and cover a few more topics. Now the problem with these two models are that they were based on the academic models that we saw earlier, based principally on Bellapodula. Now remember Bellapodula also required the uh, non-interference and the state machine models. So there were a couple models that these two uh, criteria were based upon. Uh, the problem is those academic models didn't necessarily translate to real world security needs. So recently, uh, 10 or 15 years ago, the common criteria was developed. Now the common criteria is a definition of how vendors can design and manufacture and deliver and install and maintain computer systems at a certain level, a specified and certifiable level of security. So the common criteria has seven different levels of security that we're going to be looking at here shortly. Let's first move into the TICSEC. The TICSEC again was developed by the National Computer Security Center it was written up in a book they called the Orange Book. Now the Orange Book is one of the uh, books in the Rainbow series. The Orange Book describes how a single standalone computer can be designed, manufactured, uh, delivered, installed, and maintained securely. Now it does not include the network behind this. This is simply how a single computer system can be implemented at a specified and certifiable level of security. That's the Orange Book. Again, there's a total of 26 books in the Rainbow series. Orange Book is a standalone system, whereas the Red Book is called Trusted Network Interpretation or TNI. This is now that we take an Orange Book machine and we plug a wire into it, do we satisfy the Red Book standards? So again, the orange book for the single box is based on Bella Podula and deals with confidentiality, no other, no other uh, security component. That would be no integrity and no availability concerns. The TICSEC looks at six fundamental requirements. First, there needs to be a security policy that defines and enforces security rules for a computer system. Second, it deals with marking, the labeling of the computer system and the proper uh, uh, labeling of the objects that the computer system uh, stores, sec secures, or processes. It deals with identification and accountability, assurance and continuous protection of the confidentiality of the information assets that this system is going to hold or process. The TICSEC is broken up into these categories. We have category D, which is the weakest level. That identifies a minimum level of security. Category C is the next most secure level. Now, category C identifies discretionary access control. That's what most of our commercial networks operate within. 
So your Microsoft network and your Unix or Linux network that you're dealing with, those generally run the category C classifications. Now, the weakest level here is D, then it goes to C1, which is slightly stronger, and then C2, which is stronger still. And again, we're dealing with only discretionary access control models on the category C. On category B, we roll to a higher level of security where we implement mandatory access controls. Mandatory access control systems are used primarily in high-level military and government networks because of their massive rigidity and their massive cost. So category B is stronger than category C. As we move from D up to C1, up to C2, the next category up would be B1 and then B2 and B3 being the strongest of the Bs. And finally, we have category A or A1. This is mathematically, formally verified protection. This is where a system has been mathematically proven to satisfy the highest levels of security for the system. And remember, TICSEC only dealt with confidentiality. So when I, when I refer to security, I'm speaking specifically and solely of confidentiality. Again, the Orange Book was one of the 26 books in the Rainbow series that dealt with how to implement security for your valuable information assets. A few years after the TICSEC was introduced and the United States moved into it and started specifying and purchasing computing equipment based on TICSEC, the uh, group of uh, countries in Europe, European entities, decided they needed to enhance the TICSEC specification. So they took the foundation of the TICSEC and extended it to uh, make it more diverse, identifying differently the scale of functionality <clears throat> versus a scale for in assurance. And let's talk about the difference between those two. Functionality says it has the capability of doing it at least once. That's functionality. The functionality for that specification is there. Assurance says it will perform that way every time. So functionality says if I can do it once, functionally I can do it. Assurance says I can do it the same way every single time. So the IT sec breaks those two apart and addresses functionality. Can you do it at all? It breaks that up from assurance. Can you do it 100% of the time? And again, the European enhancement of TICSEC is the IT sec. This diagram compares IT sec to TICSEC, and it shows how they pretty much align. Uh, IT sec functionality E0 equals TICSEC's level D, which is minimal uh, uh, security. F1 plus E1 equals C1, and you can see how they proceed and progress uh, upward in security from there. Now, the ITSEC also extended the scale with F6 through F10 to provide higher levels of integrity, availability, and higher level of confidentiality, including on a network. So those were some of the additional enhancements that ITSEC provided to TICSEC. So the ITSEC made the TICSEC a little more granular and descriptive about the levels of, of security that were implemented on a particular system. So that was the good news. The bad news is it still was just an extension of the TICSEC and as a result was based on abstract formal mathematical models that didn't exactly match real world security needs. So something new was needed. The common criteria was introduced in 1993 by the International Organization for Standards, or ISO. Uh, the common criteria is based more on real world need and it was developed by an international conglomeration of entities. ISO standard 15408 uh, further delineates the common criteria. The common criteria addresses these security requirements for functionality. Now, they mention toe access. Uh, that could be uh, the point of some funny statements, but uh, toe is uh, target of evaluation. 
This is the product, the computer system, that the vendor is proposing to satisfy a specific security need. So TOE is target of evaluation. That's the computer system that supposedly satisfies a security requirement. Further, the common criteria addresses assurance requirements. And again, let's put this in perspective again. Functionality says I can do it at least once. Assurance says I can do it every single time. So, the common criteria identifies what's called the protection profile. This is the government's description of real-world security needs. It identifies to the vendors seven different levels of security required of the computer systems that the government needs to purchase. So the protection profile is the government's written description of security needs. The vendor responds with what's called a target of evaluation or the TOE. The target of evaluation is a computer system that supposedly satisfies the security objectives specified in the protection profile. So the vendor takes the target of evaluation and then writes a report called the security target. The security target is a written description from the vendor explaining how the target of evaluation satisfies the protection profile described by the government describing their security needs. So again, the vendor produces the target of evaluation and the security target write-up for the target of evaluation. They then provide the target of evaluation and the security target along with a big fat check to an accredited testing center. This testing center is accredited by the government to correctly and completely evaluate the target of evaluation and then declare that it either meets or does not meet the security requirements written in the protection profile at the specified level of security. That level of security that is specified is referred to as the Evaluation Assurance Level, or the EAL. So the accredited testing center will either stamp certified or not certified on the target of evaluation. Again, the common criteria has functional requirements, can it do it at all, and it has assurance requirements. If it can do it at least once, can it do it every time? And here are the seven EAL levels, Evaluation Assurance Levels, that are specified with seven different protection profiles. And as you can see, EAL1 is the weakest, with EAL7 being the strongest security. Something also to recognize is as you test at the higher and higher levels, this turns into a much more expensive computer system. And this is the flowchart, if you will, of how this all boils down. First, the government has written its protection profiles, a description of the functional and assurance security needs for computing systems that are being sold to the U.S. government from third-party vendors. So the protection profile is the real-world security needs for these computers. The target of evaluation and security target are produced by the vendor and they describe how the target of evaluation satisfies the protection profile. Those two are sent to a third-party testing center that has been certified and accredited by the government to perform proper evaluation of the target of, of evaluation. If it satisfies the protection profile, it passes all the tests for the given EAL level, then that particular device uh, receives the certification stamp of EAL and gets added to something called the Evaluated Products List, or the EPL. Certification versus accreditation. Certification says that this device meets or exceeds the minimum level of security specified by the protection profile which aligns to the evaluation assurance level. That's certification. Accreditation is, in, in general, the government's formal acceptance that the testing center properly has tested and has properly certified this device, meeting a specific EAL level.